Good morning, everyone. I'm Quentin, and with Tim and Ahmed, we're going to give you a status on uh, the global instruction selection framework that we've been working on for the past year. So first, I start with a recap of what we presented last year, uh, which was a proposal to bring up this framework. I won't go into the motivation that led us to uh, create a new instruction selection framework, but if you are interested in those details, uh, have a look to the initial proposal listed here. So first, what do we have right now? So right now we have selection DAG. And uh, from a high level point of view, selection DAG is pretty simple. It basically takes LLVM IR as input and produces machine instars as output. But then you look closer, it's actually doing a bunch of things like combines, legalization, uh, scheduling, select, and so on. And moreover, it has, it has an additional intermediate representation that we call selection DAG node. So to summarize, it's quite complicated. With Global ASL, we wanted to break that complexity. So how we do that? Basically, we broke down the pipeline into different passes, where each pass is responsible of uh, what was done in individual phases in selection DAG. This is possible thanks to an extension of machine instar that we call generic machine instar, or GMI. And I'm going, I want, I'm going to, de I, will, I will detail that in a minute. So let's start with the IR translator. The goal of the IR translator is to translate the LLVM IR to machine instar. However, we have instruction that we may not be able to represent at this point in, in the actual target. So we need some generic machine instar. So for instance, if we take this load of a bit, it will become this generic machine instar. So let's detail that a bit. So generic machine instar have generic opcode, like uh, copies and fees. Those opcodes are available for all targets. So they are prefixed by G under bar, and those are also generic opcodes. So you have G add, G on pointer to end, and so on. Basically, you have uh, as many machine instar instructions that you need to map all the LLVM IR. The list is still evolving right now, but we try to keep it minimal. Next, virtual register defined by uh, generic machine instars have a type. So if you look in this example, we have this S1 type. So what does this mean? So S means scalar, and one is the number of bits. So we have this scalar of one bit, which matches the I1 of the uh, LLVM IR representation. So those th types in uh, Global ASL are represented by this new class, LLT, for low level type. This is a replacement of the extended value type that we use in selection DAG. And it supports three kinds of types. So scalar, represented by S and the number of bit. Vector, uh, uh, represented by the number of lane and the number of bit and pointer, which is P, followed by the, the, number, the, num, yes, the number of the address space. Another thing to notice is that virtual registers at this point may not have a register class. Indeed, the instruction may not even be legal for your target. So a forgery, there's no way you can um, assign a register class for this variable. So in the representation here, it's represented by this underbar. Next, the IR translator is responsible of the ABI lowering. So in the case of AR64, two input arguments goes into two different registers, uh, in that case, X0 and X1, and we have copies for that. Likewise, the return value is also lowered. <coughs> So for ARCH64, there would be a copy to this X0 register and then a target-specific instruction, uh, this ARCH64 uh, target-specific instruction. So one thing to notice here is that 
Generic machine inster are really an extension of machine inster. So that means you can mix both target specific and generic opcode as you want, and it just works. So that's about it for IR translators. The other instructions are just a one-to-one -one translation in that example, but it could be a one-to-many. So now that we are in this machine representation, we want something that's more amendable for the target. And to do that, we need to legalize the, the representation. And this is the job of the next pass, the legalizer. So let's see how it works. So we, we have this representation. And as you could imagine, the goal of the legalizer is to replace illegal machine inster into legal machine inster. In that example, we just have this one load of a bit that is illegal. For AR64, that's going to be legalized to a load of a byte. And then we will truncate back this value to a bit. And at this point, everything else is, is legal and we are done with legalization. So now, let's move to the next pass. So this pass is new in the global ISL framework. It's not something you could do with selection deck. So what is this RegBank Select about? RegBank Select responsibility is to assign register bank. So what are register banks first? Register banks represent roughly where a value will live. For instance, on ARH64, there are two register banks. The GPR register bank for every scalar values and the FPR register bank for floating point and vector types. So basically what this pass does is replacing this underbar by actual or uh, sort of uh, more meaningful location for the target. So let's take an example with, with this vector load. On ARH64, like I just said, vector lo loads, sorry, vectors types happens on FPR. So we can map the um, register bank using the type. We do that for all the instruction, and we end up with the following mapping. That's pretty straightforward. But actually, register bank select can do more. If you look at those instructions, they are actually dealing with just bags of bits. So that means the types is really secondary. And what's really important for them is just the size. And if you just look at the size of those types, it's actually smaller than 64 bits, and that fits in a GPR register. So you could actually map those instructions on the GPR register bank. Why is this important? If you look at the surrounding code, Everything else happens in GPR registers. So that means by doing that, you are able to avoid cross-register banks copies. So that means your code should run much faster. So basically, the register bank select pass is able to do optimization so that your code can run faster. That selection tag was not able to do. That was the red bank select pass. So now let's move to the last stage of global ISL. So at this point, we have all legal instructions with register banks. And what's left to do is to remove with this generic opcodes and use actual target specific opcodes. So if you take this load of a byte that's happened of an, on a GPR register bank, on ARH64, you'll end up with this LDRB instruction. And that's pretty much it. You do the same thing for all the instruction, and you're done. Now, just to go back a little bit, if you look at those instructions, you see that this is LDRD, so this is a vector load for load double, and or D8I8, so this is a vector or. If you look at the mapping, this, this matches the FPR uh, assignment that I mentioned. If you have used a different register bank, this would have affected the instruction selection by using the actual um, instruction that works on this register bank. So basically what I'm showing here is that 
both the type and the register bank are relevant to select the instruction. So that was instruction select. So we've been working on this pipeline for the past year, and we brought up a prototype that uh, implements a core functionality for that. Let's see the status of that. So first, we work on the IR translator and made a proof of concept where we showed it's possible to perform the translation while lowering the ABI. At first, we only support simple instructions. So by simple, I mean we, we didn't look into complex branching instructions like switches, invoke with landing pad, and these kind of things. Next, we added some basic selector capabilities. So basic in the sense that if you have anything that's illegal for the target, we would abort uh, for, for that function. And actually, we went even a bit further. We would fall back on selection DAG so that we can still be able to test the code gen produced by global ASL while not supporting the whole module. At this point also, everything would be written in C++. We wouldn't use a table gen. And uh, for register bank, we didn't do uh, the optimization I've talked about previously. We do only simple uh, bank selection. And finally, we added a simple legalization framework. It supports scalar operations and some vector operations. So with one caveat, basically we don't support weird type yet. And by weird, I mean non-power of two types. So this is something we, we still need to work on. But that's basically the, the status of the prototype. And if you look back at the, at the example that I run through the slides, you can reproduce the current, um, you can reproduce this, this example with current trunk. So everything is in tree and it works with ARCH64. So now let's dive in into more uh, key design of global ASL. And one of the key design was testability. We wanted global ASL to be much more easier to test and develop than selection DAG. So with selection DAG, we have just one way to test it. You give it LLVM IR and you look at the end result. And that's pretty much what you can do. Of course, with global ASL, you could do the same thing. But now, since each phase is, uh, is its own path, you could actually test each pass individually. And you do that with LLC dash run pass dash, uh, dash run dash pass and the name of the pass. So this is possible thanks to Alex's work on uh, the machine insta format that is now serializable. And also Matthias and a few other people that productize that so that we can use it to write tests. So it's pretty cool. I, I would recommend to use it. So it's not the only thing we, do, we did for testability. If you look now instead, inside a pass, each pass, is, each pass is built such that it's a set of transformation. So what does it, this mean in practice? So let's say you have some uh, machine, inter, machine inter as input. It goes into the pass, it does one transformation, and you get another machine install representation. The machine install representation at this stage is valid. Everything is expressed in, the, uh, in this IR. There's no state kept by the pass itself. And unlike uh, selection DAG, for instance, you don't have this big dense map with, uh, uh, that maps the nodes and edges and stuff. So what this means is that now, if you iterate through the pass, at some point, you may end up with a crash or something. But since the state is represented in the IR, you can take the IR that just came in for the last transformation and put it outside of the path and start again the debugging session from there. So it's really easy to write test cases and I think really easy to debug. Regarding testability, we could even do more. For people that work with CodeGen for quite a long time, 
they are aware of this machine verifier pass. And we could use the same thing with selection, with global ISR, sorry. So that means that now we have a way to check for invariant between different passes. So now it's possible to check that after the legalizer, for instance, there's no illegal operations. So that means you can abort the pipeline much earlier and it's much easier to find bugs. And of course, you can add more checks in the verifier to check more things. So that was testability and now Ahmed will talk about the different passes. Thank you. So Quentin explained the generic overview of the pipeline. So let's walk through the pipeline once again to investigate each of the passes. So let's start with the IR translator. So the IR translator has one pass called IR translator that's provided in a generic fashion in libcogen. So that drives the generic target independent translation process. So it creates all the G underscore instructions from the initial IR. Now the IR translator uses the call lowering class that's provided by the target. And call lowering is responsible for implementing the ABI of that target. So let's look at how that works. So here we have an example, IR. And the initial thing we do in call lowering is lower formal arguments. So in this case, we take our function and we also take the VRAGs where we expect the arguments to live. And the target is responsible for implementing the, call, the calling convention and materializing these VRAGs with the copies from the relevant registers. So in this case on ARM64, it's X0 and X1. Next, we also have calls. So for instance, we have a call instruction and we also have the result VRAG where we expect the result to live in the machine function. We're also provided with the VRAGs of each of the individual arguments. And that's how we generate the entire call sequence, including the call and the various data movement instructions. And finally, a very similar method is low return. So we're given the value that we expect to return. And the VRAG where we know that the value lives in the machine function. And the target is then responsible for emitting the sequence of the copies or stores of that VRAG and eventually the actual return instruction. So RET really LR on ARM64. So that's how call lowering works. Now, the IR translator has more interesting details about it, starting with aggregates. So if you have a struct type in LVM, in this case we have a I32 element and I8. Now the IR value is just one pointer to the entire value and we can extract the individual values of that value. Selection DAG uses a different approach. So it has one SD value for each of the fields. And global ISL, we decided to do a yet different approach. So we have one scalar VREC for the entire aggregate value. So we think that will help reduce the complexity associated with things like ISD merge values in selection DAG. But that approach does have advantages. So for instance, if you look at the SD values, it doesn't contain the padding of the structure. And so that's something that we think we have better ways of representing that. Things like all the various helper utilities that we have to track individual bits inside a value. So that's something that yet has to be done. Now constant are another interesting thing about the IR translator. So let's look at this example with two different blocks. They both use the same constant. And right now what we do is we emit that as a G constant in the entry block. And we've just used the defined VREG in each of the users. Now that does have some drawbacks in some cases. So for instance, in the, using the fast register allocator, we end up with huge live ranges and we can have extra spilling that we don't want. So we're investigating better placement of these constants. Now, after the IR translator, as Quentin explained, there's the legalizer pass. And the legalizer, once again, has one generic pass that's provided to you. It does the iterative legalization process. It uses the target-provided legalizer info class 
And that defines exactly what we do during legalization. And finally, that uses legalizer helper, which is a target independent utility that does all the common actions, the, uh, the actual nitty gritty details of legalization. And so we try to be as explicit as possible in these actions so that hopefully we make it very easy to add new things and avoid things like expand and selection DAG. So let's look at how legalizer info works. So it's all around one basic API, set action. And all of the design is driven by one decision. So as opposed to selection DAG, we decided that we don't want the concept of type legalization and we only want to legalize operations. So there are no illegal types, there are only illegal operations on those types. So let's look at one example with various compares. So on the left we have what the target implemented, so in this case it's ARM64 codes, and on the right we have some machine IR. So if we look at the instructions one by one, we start with the first instruction, so the GICMP, and we look at the opcode. So in this case, we look for all the set actions that are relevant to that opcode, and we have a few. Then we go through each of the VREGs one by one. So in this case, the result is a scalar one-bit value, and we see that it's actually a legal operand for that instruction. So we don't have anything to do. And then we move on to each of the additional VREGs. So here's the first VREG in an S32 value. So we look at all the set action calls that are defined for the first operand, operand with index one, and we find one that applies to the S32 value. And we see that it's also legal. So there's nothing to do for this instruction. We continue for all the individual operands. So now we continue, we do the same process for all the instructions. So eventually we end up to this ICMP scalar 16 instruction. So once again, we look for the set actions for that opcode, and we look for the set actions for that operand type. In this case, we see that it's a widened scalar legal legalization action, and we just need to zero extend it because we know that the predicate is included in the opcode. That's how legalization works based on legalizer info. Now there are other interesting details about legalization. So for instance, as Quentin mentioned, we don't support non-power of two types yet, and we expect that that will force us to change this API. And we also eventually want to infer legality from table gen. So from existing table gen information, we can see that if a pattern exists, then that is selectable. And by definition, everything that's selectable is legal. So that's it for the legalizer. Let's move on to RegBank Select. So RegBank Select, once again, has one generic pass. It does top-down register bank assignments. So it has all the users assigned before the defs. And currently it has two modes, so the fast mode and the greedy mode. So the fast mode does, just picks one default assignment for each of the instructions. And the greedy mode tries to evaluate different alternative assignments for each of the instructions, depending on the context. So we want to improve the greedy mode to remove copies in certain cases. And we also want to add a global mode so that we don't look at only individual instructions, but at sequences of instructions for register bank alternatives. Now, register bank select is driven by the reg bank info class that's provided by the target. And that describes everything related to register banks, starting with which register classes are inside register bank. So in ARM64, as Quentin explained, we have the FPR reg bank that covers the FPR32, so for scalar float values, register class. We also have the 64-bit FPR, FPR64 in FPR reg bank, and so on to all the VREG superclasses, the vector superclasses. And so our APIs are helpful so that in this case, if QQQQ is a superset of all the other reg classes, so FPR32 for, 32 for instance, then we just have to say that that's covered by the FPR reg bank. Now the next thing, as we explained earlier, the next thing that RegBank Select does is tries to remove cross-bank copies. And that's defined by the cost of each copy. So we have a very simple API that describes for the specific copy instruction across two banks, the cost of it, as decided by the target. 
And finally, the meat of register bank info is the mapping of each instruction onto register bank. So for instance, here we have a OR instruction. It's a 64-bit OR instruction. And on R64, we can just map it to the general purpose registers because we have X registers. But now another interesting thing that enables all the optimizations of RegBank Select is alternative mappings. So on ARM, the GOR instruction on 64-bit can also be done in a vector register. And that's why we explained that we have an alternative mapping for this instruction on the FPR registers. Now, one detail of RegBank info is that right now the two helper methods are separate. And that's only because they're expensive to compute. So right now we do the, the mapping of register banks onto instructions dynamically, and that's pretty expensive. But eventually we want to infer those mappings statically from table gen. And that will let us merge those two functions together. So that was RegBank info and RegBank select. Let's move on to instruction select. So once again, we have the generic pass that iterates on the function, does the ICEL. It traverses the blocks bottom up, so that lets you do that code elimination trivially. And it uses the instruction selector class that's provided by the target. And that's responsible for doing the generic MI to MI target specific translation. So if we look at instruction selector, there's one basic method inside, select. And that's responsible for taking these generic machine instructions, in this case a GOR, to the target specific instruction. So the first step is to pick an opcode, as defined by the target specific logic. And then we also need to assign all the VREGs to actual register classes that are compatible with that instruction. So we have, as we do right now, we have helpers to constrain register classes to other register classes. We also have that for register banks. So there are other interesting details about instruction select. So it's bound to a subtarget, and we hope that that will let us eventually reduce the complexity of having all the extra ISA extensions merged with the main selection code. And we also, once again, want to generate the selection code from table gen. So as Quentin explained, Right now, we're doing C++ handwritten code for uh, ARM64. And we want to eventually generate from the existing table gen patterns. So that was instruction select, the final pass. So for targeting, there's an additional utility that you have to use. So target pass config. So it's responsible for creating the entire global ISL pipeline. So we have methods for each of the individual passes. And we can also inject additional passes in between. And right now, GICEL accessor is your best friend. It lets you avoid lots of mandatory if defs. So to summarize, we have target pass config to describe the pipeline. We have call lowering to describe ABI lowering, respecting a call convention. We have legalizer info to describe what's legal, what's not, and how to legalize it for the target. We have register bank info to describe how to assign banks to instruction operands and what those banks actually mean. And finally, we have the instruction selector that does the remainder of the instruction selection process, so mapping the GMI to target-specific MI. And with that, I'll give it to Tim to give, talk about the steps. Thank you, Akram. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what, how we've measured up to the goals we set at the beginning of the project and how we're going to improve that over the next coming year or so. But first, I'm going to talk about an orthogonal issue that we didn't really set out to solve and haven't yet. And that's the back references from the machine IR to the original LLVM IR. They're still present, and while fixing that would be lovely, <coughs> we felt it was out of the scope of certainly this prototype and probably the whole global ICEL effort. So what goals did we have? Well, we wanted the instruction selector to be global. And I think we've, we're well on the way to achieving that. The entire IR translation phase happens at once. So while no current optimizations make use of the fact that they can access values from other basic blocks, this is a strict improvement over selection DAG where the other basic blocks simply don't exist to be used. And we need the whole horrible code gem prepare pass to fix things up. 
we wanted it to be fast. And at the moment, we're five times faster than uh, selection DAG, uh, producing slower code, of course, and within one and a half times the speed of fast ICEL on highly tuned benchmarks where it runs really well. Um, we've got some ideas to improve that and hopefully get it down to about 1.1 times in the end. We wanted to share a code pass for both fast code gen and fast runtime. And we've got the framework to do that. We've got the multiple passes in place and the, we should be able to achieve good eye selection by simply inserting optimization and more sophisticated selects in those, in that, into that framework. We wanted to avoid changing the semantics or syntax of LLVMIR and we've done that. A uh, particular help here was uh, performing the legalization at machine IR level sidestepping the whole issue of uh, encoding ABI issues into LLVMIR. We wanted it to be more configurable. Um, we are not entirely sure how well we've done here because we only support one target at the moment, but we're hopeful that uh, it will play out well in the end, only time will tell really. And similarly, we're, it's too early to say if we're easier to maintain and understand, but hopefully we're going to get there. We plan to write documentation to help with that. And the framework's certainly got better testability via the separate passes. So what are we going to do in the future? First, we're going to work on supporting all IR. This includes vector types, the non-power of two scalar types that Quentin and Ahmed mentioned, and all the weird IR constructs for exception handling and so on. We're going to work on compile time and runtime performance to first match fast ICEL and then selection DAG. Uh, fast ICEL, we're hoping to reach uh, ARCH64 in sort of early next year and runtime performance over the following years. As both of them said, we want to implement table gen support so that we can reuse all the existing .td code that exists in LLVM and not have to throw it away and restart. And we're going to deliver documentation to uh, improve, help people get started into the uh, global ICEL without having to read and understand all our horrible code. We're going to think about how to transition away from fast ICEL at first and then selection DAG on all the other targets, which is going to involve implementing a lot more backends for various purposes. Uh, so that's it from us. Any questions? You can either come up to the microphone right here or raise your hand, I'll come around. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I have a few questions, but I'm only going to do one and I'll ask the others later. <laughs> About the table gen, you said uh, you want to use it, but have you uh, tried to use whatever's already there to see if it, it works as is, or do you think you're going to have to add new semantics? to the existing table gen files, and then they could eventually break the current selection DAG, and then, you know, I mean, because I'm worried about the migration process, because I want to use global SL as soon as possible, uh, but not sooner. So we're gonna have two, at least two selection, instruction selections at the same time running in pseudo production until we can, we're confident to switch. So, and we also want to implement the ARM uh, the ARM backend in there. And of course, we could start adding all the functions for the, the target, but if we could use the already existing table gen files, you know, it would be much easier. So maybe the first thing that we could think of doing is implement the table genification of the target stuff. So then we already use what's there for the ARM uh, uh, table gen files as well as the ARCC4. And so I don't know if you guys already started this and how hard or... So that's basically the plan. Uh, we want to reuse as much as possible of the existing code without touching it. So that means we would infer uh, the mapping to the generic machine instead from the selection DAG nodes. Mm. Uh, there's one caveat here is that for the complex pattern, we would have to add a mechanism so that you we'll have to re-implement it or find something to uh, work on machine instars instead of selection DAG node. 
but other than that, so that, that should be orthogonal to what's existing, so we don't plan to, to, to touch the TD files, just reusing them, really. Right, because right now, you know, Selection Diag has this huge startup function that adds all the legal, illegal, whatever, select and expand and custom and stuff. We're probably still going to have the same thing for global ISO, yes. at least yeah. for a long for, time. For, for the beginning, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're hoping to be able to reduce it with table gen yeah. yes. and infer a lot of the legality from the patterns. And that is my worry, is how much that's going to break the table gen files for the old selection DAG. If, because we're going to have now two different descriptions. No, it's the same description. With gener from the same description, we're, we're generating two backends. So to we, targeting. we're going to use these new descriptions in table gen to regenerate the startup functions in selection DAG as well? No, we, are, we don't plan to touch that. Okay, good. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. So on the, on the register banks, there's been a controversy in LLVM about a machine that has separate address register bank and a separate data register bank, uh, Tricor, 68K, and so on. And the people who did those code gens had a lot of work to do because LLVM it loses the information about something being an address rather than a data value. Uh, do you address that? Yeah. Yeah, we've worked, uh, the generic machine instruments explicitly recommend, uh, represent every point of value to specifically address that. Thank you. Anyone else? Let's see. So I'm curious about sort of time frame, when do others start getting involved? What should we be expecting over the next six months, one year, two years, five years? What are sort of reasonable expectations to have? Tim, maybe? Um, well, as I say, we're hoping to be able to make uh, this the default O0 path on AIP64 sort of sometime next, early next year, first half maybe. Um, and then beyond that, a lot of what we can do will depend on help from other people. Um, there's things they can get going on right now with other targets, certainly, and areas we know of that, we're, that are open for parallel effort. Um, we're just sort of writing up the documentation for that and sort of separating what we need to do at the moment. So related question then, is you'd mentioned there was a fallback mode to mm -hmm. global ISL, or sorry, to selection DAG. Yeah. Can you give a little bit more information on that, sort of what the assumptions it makes are and sort of how robust that is? So it's pretty simple. What happened is that if Global ISL cannot do something, it will just stop selecting the current function, remove everything that it did, and then start again with selection DAG. So it's a function so at a time. Restart. It's a function at a time, yes. Okay. Thank you. But we're hoping that... Uh, we're going to be able to handle more than fast ISL can to begin with. So the fact that it's not at basic block level granularity still means it won't fall back, well, hopefully ever. We ran uh, global ISL on the test suite for ARCC4. Yeah. And it, when it fell back, it kind of worked. Sometimes it didn't fall back and didn't work and sometimes it did fall back and didn't work. Oh, that's strange. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think it's just because he was linking, because it, it fell back in some of the objects in the same test and not the other objects, and then something must have gone wrong. So I don't, I, I, I just, because Diana did this, I didn't, mm -hmm. so. Okay. And, and she said the numbers weren't like, it was like just a 50 objects in the test suite that could actually be compiled all the way with global ISL. Yeah, that's not surprising. Yeah, uh, which I think I think is good, you know, for the current status, it's, it's it compiled 50 whole objects, so yeah. it's something, right? So, yeah. We're up to about sort of 20% now, I think. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm, that's what I'm working on at the moment, getting it up to 90, 100%. Yeah, I'm this was a month ago, yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Okay, 20% so, is quite so good. So if, if you identify problems, we have a component in the uh, Bugzilla, so you, you could file uh, Sure. PR for that, and we will look into it. Also, if you want to contribute, patches, yeah, yeah, we, uh, we, we want to start. Do. So, if, if you can write up the documentation or just so open the, the up. documentation, we pushed it like uh, before the talk. Ah. Uh, hopefully, the server is not is now 
update, so it should be available at this link. Okay. Um, also to uh, reply to uh, Philip questions for the timeline, we think we should have some kind of table gen support sometimes at the beginning of next year, and that's when I would recommend you to start using it. Otherwise, you will have to write all the C++ boilerplate by hand. That's, that works, but it's something that you could avoid if you uh, wait a little bit. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.